Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing. Broadcasting from Huntington Beach, California, and New York City, coast to coast, a big welcome from the Big Apple and L.A. To all our listeners out there in Radio Land, I'm Dave Nassani on the Caregiver Dave Show, coming to you live from the syndicated all-positive talk radio network, HealthyLife.net. And, gosh... We are broadcasting in all 50 states and 135 countries. I think that's the right number. It might have gone up. But also (laughs) with my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruberg from thecaregiverspace.org. And just a friendly reminder that all our shows are available on demand at healthylife.net and our membership website, caregiverdave.com, 90 days later. (laughs) And we're proud that the Caregiver Dave show was voted number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on Player FM as well as number three out of thousands on caregiver podcasts on Feedspot. Well, we do have an exciting show planned for you today, don't we, Adrian? Yes, we do. We're going to be doing the great Linda McKenzie. She's founder and general manager of HealthyLife.net Radio, the very network that we're on here. It's a radio network with over 40 expert hosts showcasing only natural health self-care and news programs that reach over 1.2 million listeners a month in 135 countries, over 65 syndicated distribution channels, and she was the first woman data comm engineer in the airline industry and was president of a dietary, dietary, there we go, supplement (laughs) manufacturing company. Linda is also a multi-book author, 25-year radio host, lecturer, and audio film producer who has appeared worldwide on hundreds of radio shows, almost all network and cable TV stations, and was a star player in several award-winning documentaries. And recently on HealthyLife.net Radio's 19th year anniversary. Wow. Wow. A new positive podcast network called HRNRadio.com, HRNRadio.com, which is like TED Talks on steroids. But first, before we bring her on the show, I just want to thank our last week's guest, attorney Michael Kaplan, uh, talking about legal tips for medical malpractice. And you don't want to miss that. You can watch or listen to that and this interview on HealthyLife.net, as I said before. All right, enough of that. Linda, welcome to the show. What a privilege to finally have you on my show. Well, thanks for inviting me. I think it's a wonderful thing, and uh, I'm so glad that you're with HealthyLife.net. You've been with us since uh, September 2018, and wow, uh, you're actually on. Yeah, it has, and you're actually on HRNRadio.com because what you have to say is extremely important so people can get on with their lives in a real positive way, and that's what HealthyLife.net and me is all about. You sound like... A caregiver, Linda. Do you have caregiving in your past? <laughs> uh, well, I think I care for the whole world, believe me, with this <laughs> network. Working 10 hours a day, you know, for since 2002, seven days a week, I think that's caring a lot for people, Absolutely. which is great because we've, we, we've reached about 70 million people so far in extending positive thought and action and, and programs out there in the world, and so that's a really good legacy. But my mom um, was, you know, was uh, passing over a couple of years ago. And so for four years, you know, my brothers and I were doing um, caretaking. And I, I was, you know, I was here in California, but I would go out and spend a couple of weeks and then make her food for a couple of months and then fly <laughs> back and, you know. Because my brothers didn't know how to cook. You know how that is. You know? <laughs> From New York? Yeah, uh, I was born in in the Bronx. Oh. I'm the original. I was I'm the original gimmick. I'm half Guinea, half Mick. And, uh, <laughs> Adrian and, from New uh, York too. Yeah, and then uh, I grew up in Staten Island when I was four, and mm. uh, then New Rochelle, and then moved to California in Manhattan Beach, 
1977 and never left. So I'm here in California longer well, than New York. That's because you moved to the right Beach. place in California. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, what did you learn from uh, caring for your mother? That it was uh, that was hard probably, huh? Well, it was interesting because, um, well, you know, what, it was very interesting because my, it's, you know, we were 3,000 miles away. And my brothers are very, they, they tear, gear towards the Italian side of the house where they're very emotional and moving and whatever. And I, uh -huh. and I keep telling them that I got all the best stuff, you know, because <laughs> I was number one. So, <laughs> you know, so, so, and they laugh, you know, but, um, but anyway, so what uh, happens is, is that I would end up having to make all the decisions from here, even though they would go there. So the doctors, you know, I would tell my brothers what to do or how to do it, and I would uh, I would do the in-service caregiving. I would have to do it here, and I would do the interviews. And so it's really good that I'm psychic because I, I <laughs> knew who was right and what was wrong and whatever, and, and it was interesting. And my mom has always been difficult. So, um, and she was, you know, she drank a lot, so she was, that is not a... Um, a pleasant thing, you know, uh, to go into when you're, you know, she never lost her mind, but just being crotchety and mean and whatever. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a real tough situation. Um, but it was really interesting. I, I have to tell you a story that was kind of interesting and it has to open up minds for people. You know, it was very hard for me to get along with my mom. She loved everybody, but she did not like me. I mean, there was no way in the world. I mean, it just was. And, and it was okay. You know, I understood that. And I said, okay, fine. So um, it took me 50 years to get there, but I said, okay. Right. So, um, but anyway, so my, the doctors, uh, finally, they said that uh, they diagnosed her that she had been bipolar schizophrenic. Mm. And so we were living with a bipolar schizophrenic person all our lives, and no, and she so she was self medicating with the drink. You see, so so once I learned that, you mean alcohol, yeah, 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 and and so once I learned that, I looked up on the net and um, you know found out how do you handle talking with a bipolar person, what, what's the best way to handle them? And schizophrenia or whatever. And they, it was really interesting. They would say, don't look in their eyes. Don't talk yeah. about them in the same room. Uh, you know, there were specific instructions on what right. to do when you're talking to bipolar people. So when I went the one last time that I was, uh, you know, I was there finally, it was the last time, right? Uh, I couldn't figure this out beforehand. I guess not. I wasn't that psychic. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, anyway, so I went uh, back and I stayed with my mom and, we, and I used all those techniques. And at the end of the visit, she said, this was really a nice visit. And I <laughs> said, yes, it was. Yes, it was. So a lot of times when people are out there, they, they've got to understand that it, it's not only the taking away of the power of your life, you know, and the feeling of bad. I mean, she would say that her skin would hurt. She'd say, Linda, my skin hurts, you mm -hmm. know. So it's not only that, but it's also to understand that there may be a lot of other things going on that maybe have never been diagnosed. So to try and instead of, uh, you know, being emotionally involved with it, sometimes you have to be a witness where you step out yeah. And look at things, and it's it's a matter of taking them um, not within your heart to be part of your heart, you know, not to be part of your heart so you go through all their stuff, but to take it within your heart so that you can look and actually be a helpmate rather than someone that's, you know, part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Yeah. Did you ever get her on uh, medication for her bipolar or no? <laughs> no, she wouldn't take it. <laughs> she was really there. You know, so, <laughs> but wow. anyway, no, but, it's, you know, and everything is the way it is. And, you know, there's, um, you know, God really doesn't give you anything that you can't bear, you know. And sure. uh, and no matter what, you know, you, you know, no matter how much she treated me or whatever, I get my strength from her. I get so many d positive things that there's really no negatives on anything. You're always right in the right place at all times. So, 
you just have to make sure that you're not going to get emotionally drained, you know, uh, but look for the bigger picture. What am I, what's this trying to teach me, you know? Yeah, yeah. So the more I learn about you, the more amazed I am. Tell us just a synopsis of of your past. How did you get to be <laughs> so many of the different things that you are? I mean, uh, men haven't done all the stuff you've done. Excuse no, me? No, we're all <laughs> equal, David. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Everyone well, thinks that men are the superior uh, race. And what strong. do you mean everyone? That? Women know. Did I say everyone? I you said women. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Adrian um, keeps you know, me honest here. As <laughs> yeah, well, you know, sometimes, <laughs> you know, I, my past is so uh, varied, okay, that um, uh, there's, when I went to my PR agent, the first PR agent I had, she said, I don't know what to call you. She says, uh-huh. I, she said, you know, she said, you're just, too many things, you know, and so, um, so she, I forget what she called me. She called me something. Um, I'm 71, so I have all these little things back and forth. So anyway, okay. So basically, a lot of times, uh, necessity was the mother of invention. But what uh, to me, there's knowledge is so important to me and new experiences is really great. And so I've lived every strata of society. I, I, I grew up, you know, in New York City, but, you know, where, you know, I had three attempted rapes before I was 11. And, you know, I had, you know, one pair of clothes for the for the year. And then I went to um, lower middle class, middle class. I went into a nouveau riche. I, you know, I, I ended up with... Um, you know, people that were living next to Reagan, you know, <laughs> to old money, and then even Jet Set. I was, you know, so I've done it all. And and I've done, uh, whenever anything, I've reached the point where I think I could have learned something, you know, um, I would move. In the beginning, um, when I was, um, you know, I, it started like when I was 18. I won awards from the Metropolitan Museum of Art for uh, my artwork. And I also got a record contract with Columbia Records at the same age. Um, but the producer singer? went with the, yes, as a singer. I have this bassy voice, you know, <laughs> this uh, wonderful Earth bassy kid. voice. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I, I uh, really wanted to be an art teacher. And I won uh, a scholarship to Pratt Institute in New York, which was a prestigious art college back then, you know, back in 67, 68. And, um, but I couldn't afford the materials. So, Mm. you know, I ended up going to a community college and then I met my husband and uh, my second husband, I put him through school and he became a biochemist. And, um, and then I went back to school and I ended up in California and I um, was uh, hired with Continental Airlines and I became, I had worked for a telephone company in White Plains, New York for a while. And then when I went to Continental Airlines, I ended up working my way. They asked me what I wanted, and I said, um, they said, do you want to be a flight attendant? You know, because I was kind of cute back then. <laughs> and I said, I said, no, I don't want to be a flight attendant. They said, well, do you want to be a uh, ticket agent, you know, going on the ticket counter? And I said, no, I don't want to do that. And they said, well, where do you want to go? And I And they said, well, do you want to? be in reservations. And I said, no, I don't want to be in reservations. They said, those are the top jobs for women. I said, yeah. I said, well, put me in accounting. And they said, what? And I said, well, put me in the accounting because I want to see where the money goes and then I'll decide where I want to go. <laughs> and they said, what? And I said, yeah. And I said, and, if, and, and I said, and put me on the mail desk so I can see where the mail is and what's going on. So, you know, so they started and I was I before had before that I had been the manager of the National Radiology Registry. So um, and I was (laughs) but I took a down thing because I had wanted to travel. You know, I said, you know, I was 27. I says, God, I want to travel the world. So get a job with the airlines. (laughs) So and I was, you know, with my second husband by that time. And he had moved me out here and he was a commodities broker. And we had, you know, a couple of houses, um, you know, all over the country, actually. And we had. You know, uh, so, you know, I was working for $765 and I started looking at things and 
I didn't even know how to use a 10 key. You know? so, and people were <laughs> laughing at me. And I said, hey, don't laugh at me. Because what would happen is my psychic ability, I would find all these errors. So I would find all these million dollar errors. And they put me on everything and I keep finding errors, you know. So, uh, and then the job came up for being uh, in computers and they didn't want to put, they put me in billing in computers, but I wanted to be an engineer. So I, uh, you know, took an electrical engineering course and they wouldn't do anything. So I kind of blackmailed the guy into giving me a position because they hired this um, PhD, a master, and a, a PhD in mathematics and a master's in computer science. And they hired him, and he was the nephew of the uh, head of transportation for communist China at the time. So, you know, there was a lot of pull in that kind of thing. And then, um, and he had a degree in uh, another master's in computer science, and they hired this whole group to do all of these, this thing to redesign the network and, and do the network. And uh, the, they said that they were going to cost them $40,000. They were going to save a month because communications is one of the biggest costs in an airline aside from personnel and, and fuel. Um, and so, but what they did was and, and the guy hated me. He did not want to put me in engineering. He put me in an orange room. Do you, uh, do you know what an orange room is? Uh. That's bright orange. No walls. And he would scream at me. He'd say, I'd be using, a, you know, and I was in artwork, so I was using a, uh, you know, a German engineering set to do the uh, the um, drawings, you know, of the uh, the blueprints and stuff of the where the satellite communications were or whatever. Well, push comes to shove. Um, he needed to save $40,000 a month. And I went through all of these. He wouldn't give me anything to do. So I started going back through the billing. And he was such a mean guy. He had fired so many people mm -hmm. that all these circuits were there. And I found over $40,000 of circuits cost monthly, <laughs> you know, to do it. And he, and he said to me, he goes, well, he goes, um, and then he was in a lot of trouble because they not only cost him 40000 but they, they didn't save the 40000 but they cost him another 40000 this group that he hired. And I had found 40000 in one-time costs and 40000 a month. So I went in and I said, hey, I need to talk to you. And he goes, what do you want? He goes, I'm not happy. And I said, what if I told you I can get you a bail you out of the water? And he wasn't listening. So I said, hey, I said, look. Um, here's what it is. And I showed him a little piece of uh, the thing. I says, I can guess how much do you have here? I said, 40,000. Uh, and I said, and another 40,000 one time cost. He goes, that's exactly what I need. I says, I know. I said, but you're not getting it. <laughs> I says, I'm going to rip it up and you're not getting any of it. And he said, what? And I said, all I want you to do is give me something to do. I said, train me and let me work with the people and let me do what I need to do. And if you do that, I'll bail you out. If you're going to keep me doing this kind of stuff, you know, this baby stuff that you're giving me, I said, I don't care if you go down the hill, you know? So he said, okay. And he, true to his word, he did. And I uh, was written up in the telecommunications journals uh, for redesigning the teletype. And I put in, uh, I was very well known in the industry and I ended up, after Continental got bought out, I went to work for Western, and then I um, started a consulting company, and I redesigned the U.S. Senate Computer Center, and, and at that time, there weren't very many women in. And then after that, that led me to um, opening the first used PC store in America, which got me in who's who of American women and all over the place. And um, well, we get the idea. Was, you are you are brilliant. Let's fast forward to healthylife.net now because we're running out of time. <laughs> okay. But I'm sure you can I, go on for the whole show just telling me I, all the things you've done. I just want to yeah. know if they ever repainted the orange room. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that was tough. no. They never did. <laughs> Well, in uh, 1992, well, we're going to take a break, and we're going to take a break in two minutes. Let's take a break early first before we do that, and then that way I won't have to interrupt you. So we'll be right back. Don't go away. All right. 
Our featured speaker is a best-selling author who has written numerous books and articles. He's a speaker, life coach, and host of Dave the Caregiver's Caregiver radio program. He frequently appears on television and radio shows all across the country and has even shared the stage with Suzanne Summers at Harvard. But his most important role is caregiver to his beautiful wife, Charlene, for over 22 years. Please welcome Mr. Dave Nassani! I want to share with you a love story. In a couple of weeks, my wife and I will be celebrating 44 years of being together. My wife, Charlene, and I had a fairy tale, storybook, romance, courtship, and marriage for the first 21 years of our lives together. One day out of nowhere, my wife has a headache, the headache of her life. She suffered a massive stroke and it left her severely speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. And in that moment, our world turned upside down. I gotta tell you, the next two years was like a living hell. I just didn't know what to do. I felt guilty most of the time. I became a caregiver. I didn't even know what a caregiver was. I was experiencing the same problems that other caregivers experience. If you don't take care of you, I can't take care of her. Well, that's why I wrote the book. Now I can teach other caregivers. I'm living proof that you can thrive as a caregiver. My wife and I travel now all over the world sharing our story. One day, life is gonna call upon you to be the captain of your boat. Heck, you might be saving your own life. Thank you. Yeah. And we're back with our guest, Linda McKenzie of the HealthyLife.net radio network and my co-host, Adrian Gruberg. I'm Dave Nassani on the Caregiver Dave Show. So uh, we're, we're up to your story where you're, you're going to start a radio network. Where the heck did you get that idea from? Um, well, I, had, I was in radio. I went into radio in 1996 after my daughter graduated college. Um, I said, no more left brain. I want to do some right brain <laughs> stuff. So I wrote a couple of books and I won a couple of awards and then lectured all over the United States and then um, got into radio in 1996 and then started doing a lot of television. And um, I, it's a funny story. I, I was uh, offered from Sci-Fi um, the John Edwards um, show, Crossing Over, you know, and I and Mary from Sci-Fi said, oh, I really would love you to do a show. And she said, we have this show. And I said, well, that's not really in truth. And I only do things in truth. So, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. And she said, well, you design any show you want. We'll, we'll design a, a show for you. I said, okay, great. And so I went home and I was all excited. I'm saying, great, everybody's going to know me again and I'm going to be really famous and blah, blah, blah. And God comes in and he goes, hey. And I said, yes. And he said, he said, I want you to do a, I want you to put on a radio network for me. I said, what? And he said, well, he goes, you know, when you're out lecturing right now, he goes, you're reaching a thousand people. He said, but if you bring more people to you, like you, who really want to help the world and teach them how to do positive things and how to get out of fear. He said, and you bring all these people together. He says, instead of being a point of light, you become a lighthouse. And I said, oh, okay, but you know, you know what's happening, right? They're offering me this TV show and he's going, yeah, he goes, and you don't have to do it. I said, yeah, like, right. Uh, God's going to ask me to do something. I'm going to say, no, I said, I don't think that's going to work. So I said, but when I get upstairs, we're going to have a talk. When I get upstairs, we're having a talk. So I started the network, and the network was successful. We were profitable third month out, and nobody was doing internet radio back in 2002. I actually sat on my hands for five years and waited to do something like that. And, um, and nobody on traditional media wanted positive talk. Even at my radio station, I was number one. I went to 246 markets. And I was number one in within two weeks. You were being and, positive. Yeah, and I was doing no negativity and, you know, just talking, um, you know, doing some really great stuff and had huge followings. I'd get 36 to 42 call-ins per show in a 40-minute period when I allowed that to come in. And um, But they'd never really syndicated me, so I ended up being syndicated myself on about five channels, but it wasn't really big. But no matter where I went, I broke all records for call-ins. And so, um, you know, I just did it. And so 
Uh, and we've been very successful. And on October 2nd um, of 2020 was our 19th year anniversary. And on that day, I started HRNradio.com, which is an ad-free version. And there's uh, 2,400 plus podcasts ad-free, all on Positive Talk, evergreen shows, and like your show is there. And um, we have up to five years of shows. And and it's uh, very inexpensive. It's a subscription service because like all businesses during these times, you know, uh, most of them, unless you're a big data company or a pharmaceutical company, you're suffering a little bit. So I didn't want to, yeah. um, you know, our expenses have risen and the money, of course, is, is fine, but it's not, you know, I want to make sure that we stay in perpetuity. And so by doing a subscription network and we're very inexpensive. Um, you know, it, it was, it's a good way to help everybody and keep people, uh, f- maintaining them to keep positive during, during this pandemic and afterwards, because we need all of that right now. And so these, these shows are great because what happens with HR and radio is that you can go onto the site and you can decide that you want to talk about caregiving, right? And so you type in the search engine caregiving and every show, no matter what host it is, comes up on caregiving. And so you want cancer or whatever. So if you have, and we only do natural health on our network. And right now, you know, Google and Facebook and all that, they're censoring natural, they've been censoring natural health since September 2019. And so we're the only place to to get a lot of this information. And we have top people. We have uh, Dr. Bernie Siegel, the cancer doctor. We don't have anybody. He was on our show. It's very hard to get on our network, right, David? (laughs) (laughs) It's hard because there's a lot of people that want to come in, but unless you're there, that you really have a heart where you really want to help people or the planet, we don't want you. And I, I, we're not advertiser driven. You know, we walk our talk. So you'll never find a big pharma ad on our company or, you know, any, uh, uh, or a McDonald's ad uh, or anything like that. You know, we really walk our talk in truth and integrity. So Linda, what does positive uh, mean? I mean, you know, does it mean uh, you never um, talk Anything that could be negative, even though it's the truth, or is it Pollyanna outlook? I mean, explain what it means to to be a a positive talk radio network. Okay. It's very easy. It's just a matter of reframing. For example, if you say uh, there's a 10% chance of rain, (laughs) or you say there's a 90% chance of sunshine, both are correct. But it's how you word the stuff that makes it palatable and doesn't induce fear. So um, do we have controversy on our shows? Yes, but it has to be controversy with answers. We don't leave you hanging. We give you answers. So we talk about things. You know, we talk about COVID and we probably don't have the same outlook that most Western medicine and media does. But all of our stuff is well researched. You know, I've been a health journalist for, you know, since 1996. I owned a vitamin company, you know, um, and I've been into natural health since the 70s. So, um, and I'm very well versed with people and things. I've, you know, interviewed many, many of the top people in the field. And so we gather our information, not just, we don't gather it from CNN. I go direct to the CDC. I read that. I go to the BMJ journals. I go to... Sweden, I'm uh, hooked up. We're hooked up. We're not a small network. Um, we're kind of like an NPR, okay? And mm-hmm. we have uh, we work with the White House. And um, you were telling me the, that your ratings sometimes uh, uh, are right up there with CBS and and the the, the big guys. And we are big. we actually, <laughs> yeah, we actually have a lot more listeners than they do. Um, yeah. But they they uh, we have third party statistics and. Um, and we do, we just have, we have a lot more than they do, but because what they do is they're all, we talk truth and we're, and we are, um, we've, and, and what happens is, is that unlike podcasts and stuff, sometimes podcasts, 
you don't know where to listen. I mean, if you're on 15 different stations, you just don't really know where to listen. And whereas what we did with our station, even though we have podcasts and on-demand listening, what we do is we syndicate the whole network. So when you're in Australia, uh, you'll know, or any place, no matter what channel of the 65 channels we're on, from smartwatches to private networks for the blind to prison systems to being aired in retail stores, we're in places nobody else is. But no matter where you are and no matter how you're listening, you're listening to the same show at the same time that everybody else is because we're 24-7. So we're not like blog talk radio and things like that. We are everybody here has 25, 30 years in the traditional radio industry. We're members of the National Association of Broadcasters. So we're not, um, you know, just trying to, you know, we all come from traditional radio. So even though we don't have to follow FCC rules, we do. And, um, and we use the same tactics and formats and stuff as regular radio because why change something that's working? Right. Yeah. And, of course, being positive uh, lowers your stress level, and that increases the immune system, right? So yes, you're keeping people alive, I think, also, just by being positive. Well, yeah, I think so, too. But it helps to – here's a little trick for your listeners, too. You know, when you're feeling down, and who isn't these days? Even I get down with all this lockdown. I keep on saying, you know, we're in, in – here in L.A. County – you know, we're, we're still in Manhattan Beach. In L.A. County, I feel, I keep asking, are we in a hostage situation? Because the lockdowns <laughs> never feel stop. Like I think, I think, I think we're over in hostage territory now. <laughs> and, um, and so what you can do is when you're doing that, there's a real quick trick that will get you out of your doldrums. And it is to hum. And all you do is hmm, 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 hmm. Any way you want, or you can sing, or but mostly hum. And when you hum, it takes the energy of your body and puts it into your heart chakra or to your heart. And those upper chakras, these upper energy levels, will align you into happiness. So all you have to do in, when you're feeling bad is hum. And understand, there's never any mistakes. You're always in the right place at the right time. And it's if you if you think it's negative, it's not. It's just trying to teach you something. And once you learn that, you move forward, and you never have to go through that again. It's just well, a wonderful life. People in a life. good mood do hum, but you're saying uh, humming will put you in a good mood. Mm -hmm. Yes, like it, it automatically shifts the energy. So little I tricks like of the it. trade. After 71 years, <laughs> I must have one or two of those. That, that's I think. a freebie for I us, think. huh? Yeah, yeah, that's a little little tidbit. Well, listen, we're going to take another break, so we'll be right back. Don't go away. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too, Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com. Hey, we're back on the Caregiver Dave Show with our guest, Linda McKenzie, my co-host, Adrian Gruberg. I'm Dave Nassani, and we are talking about HealthyLife.net and Positive Talk Radio. And, uh, you know, I remember back in the old days when, when you turn on the radio or you turn on the TV, and it's like there was more good news than bad news. Oh, Babe Ruth just hit another home run. Of course, I'm not old enough to know Babe Ruth. But, but 
they don't like good news, do they? They like bad news because bad news instills fear and it, bad news sells newspapers, if anybody else buys a newspaper anymore. Um, oh, they're now, going back to that. They're yeah. actually going ratings. back to buying newspapers. <laughs> Yeah. Ratings. Uh, so they don't right. really care about making you feel better. They just care about no, putting more money in their pocket. So you're well, just that the and, and also they need to um, they need the the head count, right? So right. what happens is that they um, will actually and 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 here's the difference in most countries. You know, being in telecom, I know all this stuff. In most countries. The government owns the media network. So if you go to England, the BBC is actually owned by the government. Okay, mm -hmm. so the government tells it what to do. And every single one of these countries has that except the United States. And in the old days, it was really great because, you know, if you had a radio station, you couldn't own a TV station. If you had a TV station, you couldn't own a newspaper. Right. If you had a newspaper, you couldn't own a magazine and vice versa. But now... Mm -hmm. They let it go, and so six people own all of the media. Right. Six people. That's the okay. problem. I was trying to figure That's out what the problem the was. That's the problem. <laughs> That's we the need problem. to change so, some laws, you know? Yes, we do. And so, but, um, and so that's what's, what's part of the problem. And so, um, so they have uh, their agendas, and that's what they're doing. And it's just like, you know, why is the media pushing only one alternative? There's plenty of alternatives with this coronavirus, you know, having owned a vitamin company for five years and being president of one and designing great formulas that were great. Um, there's plenty of alternative medicine stuff that can stop the coronavirus without a vaccine. Well, I remember and when so, they were trying, when the F FDA was trying to outlaw all vitamins and supplements they're doing it again. and all of that stuff. Are they doing it again? They're, they're, yeah, they've done it Does five Big times. Does Big Pharma before. have anything to do with that by any chance? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, all the time. They, they do it all the time. And so you just have to follow the money. So instead of being, you know, I, I'm feeling that there's two kinds of people in the world right now. There's mindless people and mindful people. Now, the mindless people, um, <laughs> they don't want to take responsibility, okay? And so what they do is they believe what CNN tells them, or they believe what their doctor tells them, and they and they don't want to hurt grandma. They don't, and they don't want to take that responsibility of hurting grandma. So they're just going to go along. But what happens is we're actually losing a lot of freedoms here, um, and we're fighting it in a good way, and uh, and they're not able to do it because in the beginning, if you remember, here in California, Newsom would say we're not going to be let out of this lockdown until we have a vaccine. And then 61% of the people said, no, we're not taking the vaccine. So then he said two weeks later, well, until we have an immunological thing, you know, and then, and then now you can get the vaccine. They're trying to push the vaccine. They're actually um, giving millions and millions of dollars to, for, to propaganda to get you to get this vaccine. There's no long term, term testing. It changes your DNA. There's adverse side effects. 0.4% for severe side effects uh, from the Pfizer vaccine, 1% severe side effects from the Moderna vaccine, and 0.001% from the coronavirus. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, really, let's just take a look at the decimal points. But, but if somebody wants to get it, that's fine. Uh, the, the, and so, so what I'm saying is that we have to make sure that we're mindful and do our research and not just from traditional media. We have to do our research so that we make the right decisions for ourselves, no matter what that is. It's okay. Everybody has a right to choose. And that's the other thing. Stop shaming people. You know, everybody has a right to do whatever they want to do. Look, if you think that this virus is really bad and you st stay in your house then, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, this is America. You know, we can do so, what we want, right? Well, At least, well supposedly, maybe it is. You know. Yeah. Listen, we're going to take another quick break, uh, last break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. One Arm, One Leg, 100 Words, Overcoming Unbelievable Hardships, is about Charlene, a stroke survivor. Back in 1996, Charlene was a healthy, normal, very active 52-year-old woman whose amazing talents resemble that of both a Martha Stewart and a Wonder Woman. But all that changed when she suffered a massive stroke 
that left her severely speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. Who am I? My name is David. I've had the privilege of being Charlene's husband since 1975. We had a wonderful fairy tale, storybook like courtship that culminated in our marriage a year later. Charlene had just come out of a marriage where, after 10 years, she received two black eyes and a broken nose by her former husband when he came home high on speed. Charlene believed in no second chances of any kind for abuse, so she left. Finding herself all alone in the world with her five and ten-year-old daughters Cynthia Lorraine and Deborah Lynn, she started raising them by herself for the next two years. Then fate brought us all together. After falling in love with Charlene, Cindy, and Debbie, our love then produced Rebecca Elizabeth. We had a wonderful, normal life for the next twenty years. But today, things are very different for everyone. How about the reaction of nine-time Grammy and Dove Award recipient? godfather of contemporary gospel Christian music, Andre Crouch. Charlene just won't let the promises of God go, and she has not let her circumstances get in the way of her faith. She's not just a survivor, she's more than a conqueror, as the Bible states. You'll be encouraged by her testimony, regardless of what you're going through. Available everywhere. And we're back with our guest, Linda McKenzie, um, caregiver Dave, Adrian Gruberg. Um, so your network, HealthyLife.net, um, is really into natural health. And um, censorship is not just for conservatives, like they're complaining. It's also for natural health stuff. What's going on yeah. here? Well, um, the big pharmaceutical companies, um, they're all together, you see, because um, – Alphabet is making biochips and working on some um, uh, data uh, pharmaceutical things um, and methods with um, Big Pharma. Um, Amazon is, um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Amazon does, um, uh, Amazon, well, my, my, my friend, Dr. Fauci, you know, he started a lot of, this kind of stuff back in Wuhan University mm -hmm. and uh, Harvard University caught him and, with his hands there and they slapped him and Obama said, hey, first George W. Bush said, stop giving this money to bio warfare. And then he did it again and he moved it over to Wuh Wuhan University, designing a bat virus and he owns part of Moderna vaccine company Follow and so you, you slap his you slap his hand and uh harvard came up and slapped his hand, and obama said no more money for this i mean so it's not a republican democratic issue it's a big pharma issue follow the money so the data companies all make money facebook makes tons of advertising money so does media It'll pick up a magazine full page ads all you see on TV is all those ads with the side effects, right? So, um, so they're handling everything, and so uh, they're, everybody's compromised. So the, who made the big money? Big Pharma, as Pfizer is making $396 billion just on the first round of this vaccine. Mm. Who's first paying round. that? The, the taxpayer is paying that? The taxpayers. Well, listen, this the is The printing a press, deal. I should say? Yeah. The printing yeah. press, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This is a great deal. Okay, so you tell me a business where you go to the government and say, hey, could you give me money to, so I can make my product? No wonder they, <laughs> no, no wonder they, they yes. kicked it out in less than a year. Right. right, right. So then they give them a billion dollars, a couple of billion dollars to do that. And then they say, okay, listen, but we're making the product, but now you've got to buy the product back from us. We're not going to just give it to you for free, even though we took your money for it. So right. now <laughs> they're paying $25 per dose the government pays, and then you do it, they have to get two doses. But the first dose, so that's, right. you know, $396 billion. And then, then they said, listen, you know, I mean, you guys are great, but we don't want any liability for this because, you know, you know, we don't have any liability for any vaccine. So if something happens <laughs> right. to you, we want you guys to pay for it so the taxpayers pay for that again. Remember, the billion dollars we gave to them, taxpayer money, the billion dollars, the money that we're paying them to buy back the vaccines that we paid for, taxpayer money. Then you go back, you go to, to uh, get liability, taxpayer money, but the government says, okay, if you die from this new vaccine that nobody's ever tested, you get $2,500, that's it. So... Um, <laughs> 
And then on top of that, then they have the audacity to come back and say, my God, we can't pay for delivery. You guys are going to have to get the Department of Defense to deliver the stuff. Into right? your arms, yeah. So it's a freebie. It's pure profit so, so for them. So they're not really contributing anything to the welfare, like saying, okay, here's mm-hmm. our contribution to help society, right? They just mm-hmm. give, give, yeah. give. Nothing. They've done nothing. And they've done nothing. And so, and so, um, and so there's a, a problem with that, you know. I, 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 mean, I bet I they don't like you either, though, people. right? <laughs> well, they can't touch me. I mean, the government, government, you know, it's okay. You know, the government's been tracking me as a psychic since I'm 15 years old and have asked me to work on many different things. And when I was a psychic, uh, one of the presidents, I'm not going to tell you which one, uh, asked me to be their psychic when they were in office. And I said, I don't do politics. Was it and one I of don't the presidents or was it one books. of his wives? <laughs> well, it was actually both, actually. <laughs> and if you don't, if you don't know this, Every major power in the world uses psychics, whether they tell you that or not. And really? they have since the beginning of time. That's interesting. Yeah, there's lots of stuff I could tell you. Anyway. Yes, <laughs> All right, well, we're running out of anyway, time. We've got, we've got four it's minutes. So you, in those four minutes, you have to tell us about uh, HRN Radio and what's ahead for you in the future. Uh, well, uh, hrnradio.com, please take a look at that. And it's really great stuff. You'll get all of Dave's shows on there, and uh, you'll be able to uh, get lots of information on many different things. And if there's uh, many ways to do it, you can do a, a once a month, uh, and that's uh, um, $9.99 if you want to just try it out for a month. If you want three months, it's $7.99 per month. If you want it for a year, it's $4.99. It's less than the cost of a mm-hmm. cup of coffee. And then you'll get the 20, I think it's actually 2700 there, but we'll say 24 And, and there's a, a podcast. And then we add 70 new podcasts a month plus a couple of new hosts. So, and you've got um, uh, like dozens and dozens and dozens of categories, maybe a hundred different categories, right? Uh, well, we have five different kinds of categories. We have um, business um, and um, a community, and um, uh, we also have lifestyle and uh, motivation, inspiration. We have natural health and fitness. Uh, we have um, a lot of. Um, uh, spirituality and intuitive arts, where we have comparative yeah. religions News, and society, variety, culture, yeah. natural health, fitness, yeah. lifestyle, inspiration, yeah. variety, motivation, and spirituality, and... intuitive yeah. arts. Yeah, you got yeah. a lot of stuff. We got it all. We got a lot and, of stuff. And each There's one in that different. category is slightly different. Yes. The hosts. Yeah. That's right. But they're all in. It's one place. If you're looking for positive podcasts, I. You know, first off, if you're out there and you're looking on TuneIn, I mean, even on Netflix, I'm sitting here trying to find a movie to watch, and there's a hundred movies. I uh. I don't know where to go. But with <laughs> here, you can if you want all positive podcasts that give you a boost of energy, that teach you things, that lifts you up. This is the one place where you can get it all. And so caregivers certainly see, need to be uplifted, don't they? Yeah, and if you have depression, we've got tons on that. We've got things on thyroid. We have Ayurvedic medicine. We have Susan Weed does herbs, and she she graduated Stanford at 15. Mm. And then she she owns half of Woodstock now. She decided she got to. <laughs> All right, we got a one minute to go. How can someone get a hold of you, find out more about you, and HealthyLife.net? Okay, just go, go, there's a couple places, www.healthylife.net for the radio show, hrnradio.com for the podcast network. And, of course, for me, you can go to lindamckenzie.net, M-A-C-A-E-N-Z-I-E.net. We're on all the social media. And please join us. We'd love to have you. We want you to be positive. Yay. And that's if you want to listen or if maybe there's a caregiver out there who says, you know what, I have something to give. I want to help uh, whatever, uh, maybe they're good in uh, in how to how to build a uh, vegetable garden or something. They can start a show with you, right? Well, yes, and but you have to have. Um, we do they provide some training, but okay. it has to be positive, and we really need you to have a following. 
most people that come to our network are from TV, radio, or yeah. have natural. Uh, That's natural true. Electric. That's true. Because, I had I had the radio you know, show when I came to you as well. I had a following. That's correct. And and we and the thing is is because we have the best of the best. So when you yeah. come here, we have professional people, and we know how to do our business, and we know how to keep you interested. At least I hope so. I hope somebody <laughs> so interested at the end of this show. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Linda. You are an inspiration. You're amazing. I learned so much just in the last uh, forty five minutes. So. Thank you, and um, everybody, we will see us again next time. So, bye-bye. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again.